Hello and welcome everyone to our next episode of Helping Trade Podcast, where we give space to entrepreneurs and their ventures. My today's guest is Carlyle. Carl is a serial entrepreneur, born in Australia, but before I say too much, Carlyle, please, the stage is yours. Great, it's lovely to be here, so thank you for the invitation. And serial entrepreneur, it's kind of one of those funny terms, isn't it? It could have a positive aspect or a negative, but I guess I've done, I've been an entrepreneur more than once. I guess I'm, I'm worthy of that title of serial. I've been in Switzerland for 12 years now. I'm Australian born. I first came to Europe uh, as part of my professional career, which was with the pharmaceutical industry. I've always worked in marketing and communication and brand building. So with that experience, over time, I worked both on the agency side as a consultant to different companies, including Pfizer and CSL Bearing. What's made my journey pretty interesting is that along the way, as a communicator and as a brand builder, there's always been a very strong entrepreneurial streak within me, which has led to more than once in establishing either a brand or a service in a company where those ideas and aspirations have been brought to life. That's one of the best introductions I ever heard from anyone <laughs> on the podcast so far. Okay, thank you. I would really like to dig into your strengths, what made you really turn into entrepreneurship, but I think there is also interesting to dig into your past. How did you start with entrepreneurship? What was your first experience? What could count as a first entrepreneurial experience even? I was thinking about that. I, I think I've always been someone who's been driven to bringing ideas to life. I think we spoke earlier over a coffee, but my first, I guess, entrepreneurial experience was about the age of eight, maybe eight or nine, where I found an old lawnmower in a rubbish tip. And I thought, okay, this would be fun to try and, to try and fix. And I'm not, I'm not a mechanically minded person at all. Short story was I, I got this thing going started it and sparks flew everywhere and before I knew it the engine was running and I don't know how but from there on I was making some handmade business cards and cutting them out with scissors and I, I put them into all the neighbors letterboxes and before I knew it I had pocket money because I was able to mow their lawns with this lawnmower the funny story is that the lawnmower didn't last beyond the first job but I, I was able to get customers and those customers allowed me to use their material and their and their lawnmowers and I remember doing that for a couple of summers and I think the joy there was an idea that had come to life, but more so as a young, young guy growing up in the countryside, I had pocket money and I'd made it, I'd made that money myself. So I think that's my, my earliest entrepreneurial experience. It's also a great metaphor for entrepreneurship. You build something in your shack that sparks and, and does something, you made the best out of it, but the customers come, so hey, it works, it's a product. Well, I think the other thing about that simple example is that things don't never go to plan, do they? Like I had this grandiose idea that this was the machine I needed to do that job. That machine didn't last, didn't work, but the idea of being able to still do that activity continued. And I think that's a big learning in being an entrepreneur. The buzzwords around business today is being agile and, and having that ability to kind of move and weave and dodge. But I think you need that as an entrepreneur because those initial plans, at least in my experience, particularly in the companies that I formed and when I got a little bit more professional in what I've been doing in the last few years, there's been a lot of flexibility required because those initial plans often really don't go as you, as you might imagine. One of the first things that entrepreneurial lessons are, you need to be able to pivot to the right direction and you need to recognize that right opportunity. Assumption is good and fine, but only the customer will actually tell you what they really need and you need to be able to listen to and adjust, adapt, evolve and bring something that is really worthwhile. And usually it has nothing to do with the initial concept. Right, yeah, well said. That's where I think I really, a lot of entrepreneurs have phrases and their mentors have kind of instilled different beliefs. But one of the things that I've really, really gravitated towards over the last few years is that whole concept of failing fast. Nobody wants to fail, particularly as an entrepreneur, but you also don't want to be gambling. I've seen it with friends and colleagues around me and other entrepreneurs, but getting an idea out there or building a product or a service is one thing. But the trap is that we often fall in love with our own products. And that doesn't mean that customers feel the same way that we do. So I think there's a couple of things there. One is, you know, we have to be careful not to fall in love with our own ideas or our own products to the point where we don't see that they might not be wanted or needed in a marketplace. And I think the second bit is that once we've got a product or a service out there, 
we've got to kind of see that it's viable as quickly as we can. We're injecting money, we're injecting time and, and sweat. That can't go on forever. We need to get a return at some point. So I really like that idea of, of failing fast. Not because I want to fail, but you want to see whether you've got something viable. Too often we spend a lot of time convincing ourselves that we've got something because we have built or created a beautiful product. But that's just, I think, step one of a very long journey for a lot of entrepreneurs. Do you know the term, kill your darlings? Right, yeah, <laughs> something similar, right? That is exactly what popped up in my mind right now when you, when you yeah. were speaking about do not fall into your ideas too much. Yeah, it's a, I think it's a fine line. We talked about this earlier, but being an entrepreneur, it's sort of cool and trendy and there's a real Generation X component to it. But it's also a curse because I think being an entrepreneur is, means that you have a certain way of operating, you have a certain way of thinking. And that way of operating and thinking might not work in a conventional company. And I've had that big company blue chip experience where it worked for a while, but then it got to a point where my brain didn't fit that model anymore. Being an entrepreneur, I think, has a lot of advantages and disadvantages to it. But I think one of the things is that it's not just about creating, it's about implementing as well. And I've met lots of entrepreneurs who are fantastic at creating, but the real work, and if you look at the sort of that, that value chain of activity, The longest element usually of the value chain is in the implementation bit. It's not the development phase. And in the end, we'll always develop, build the idea or the product we have in mind. If we can't do it ourselves, we'll bring in third parties. We'll, we'll source that somehow. That bit will get done. That's been my experience at least. Where the real heavy lifting and the longer aspect of the marathon comes in is really that ongoing implementation. And then, at least in my experience, the ongoing management and the running of a business. And I think we forget the running of a business bit as entrepreneurs, at least in our early years as an entrepreneur, because we're so focused on that development bit, which kind of, let's face it, that's the fun, sexy bit in solving a problem, building a solution. That's the bit that really keeps us up until 3 a.m. But it's not that fun sometimes running a business year after year, day after day, with maybe revenues that aren't what we imagined. So the fun stuff is the development bit. So I think there's another angle there that we, we could talk more about. But as an entrepreneur, I think we really need to see the full value chain from development to implementation to maintenance. Because it's a bloody big journey. And I think we're all good at different parts. You know, I don't know your view on that. I'm just wondering right now, having you as a serial entrepreneur in front of me, does it mean you're very good at creation? Or is there also a proven record of you implementing stuff in the long journey? Yeah, well, I've done both. I think in my heart, I enjoy solving problems and either solving a problem through a service or through a product offering. If I'm not solving a problem, then create one and then build a product that you can dovetail into that. I've got two recent examples of my entrepreneurship have been, you know, I moved into a sports industry where I, I created a, a premium sports apparel brand you know, entered into a completely chock-a-block market, competed against one of the most highest selling products in the market, took market share from them and did really well. But that was, you know, that was about building a brand and maybe a product that might not have been that different to what was out there. But building a brand and a premium service around that product is what allowed me to enter that market. It was definitely fueled by my passion as a competitive cyclist. So there was a lot of passion from a consumer perspective, knowing that I could do it better. So that was kind of one angle. So I didn't really solve any problems there. I really just fed my own ego and desire to dress myself in a more functional level of, of sports apparel than what was available. And it just so happened that my perception on what the market was offering was also agreed by worldwide customers. So I kind of validated myself. But the most recent example where I'm now really in a service-oriented industry where I'm really solving a problem is a completely different proposition. It's looking at, it's introducing a technology where there's a real improvement on doing a task versus how it's been done over the last few years. And with that comes another layer of doing it in a much more elegant and professional way where in the end I could probably have a, a price point of maybe four to five times more than that service has been traditionally charged. And because it's done in an elegant way, the technology makes it faster, better, quicker, all the stuff that we expect. Customers are also willing to take on that and pay for that. 
So I've sort of had that service experience and the product experience. And to come back to that first point, you're not always solving a problem, but I think you're always wanting to do something better. And I think that's that traditional academic definition of innovation which is probably the most used and abused word amongst entrepreneurs. But what's really true is that innovation is really about doing something better, not necessarily quicker or, or faster, but it's looking at how you can improve on the delivery of a product or a solution. And sometimes it's a very small area of margin that you can tap into that is an incremental benefit or an incremental improvement on the way something might have been done in the past. So it doesn't always have to be radical doesn't have to be this amazing revolutionary step from point A to point B. There can be small incremental steps that make something a lot better than how it might have been offered or, or produced in the past. It's a very positive attitude. But we also spoke about like certain expected pitfalls on the entrepreneurial journey. And you mentioned one, which is fail fast, essentially. Be capable of learning from your mistakes as one of the pitfalls that we have to be aware of. What other pitfalls do you think we have to be careful on our entrepreneurial journeys? I think there's a couple there. I think one is to surround yourself with people that will challenge you. Because again, when we fall in love with our own activity or our own product, it's like being, I'm a father now of a young daughter. You don't want anyone telling your two-year-old girl's not beautiful because in your eyes, she's the most beautiful girl you've ever seen. So I guess what you need is a soundboard where you, you are propped up and motivated by highly energetic people, but also an element of truth where they will have the courage to say to you, listen, I think now you've been chasing this investment for a couple of years, you really don't have any customers in that pipeline. Maybe it's time to reconsider the strategy. So I think surround yourself by positive, like-minded, potentially other entrepreneurs, but also make sure within that audience mix of your inner circle, you've got people that are happy to challenge you to keep that level, that balance of of what's realistic versus what your aspirations might be. So I think that that balance of surrounding yourself with the right people is probably one. I think for me, the second one, which is where at least from one of my companies was a real challenge was chasing investment too hard. As entrepreneurs, we need a certain level of capital. Often our own injection of capital is time and expertise, initially not so much financial elements. The money many of us bring to a new business as entrepreneurs is limited and at some point that gets burnt up really quickly so we're, we're chasing additional money. I did that a couple of times and as a consequence probably brought in the wrong people into my business because I bought people in that had money versus people that had additional skill sets. And I guess there's a few ways you can finance a business. You can bring in people with that capital and diverse your shareholding because you're offering up shares to that people. But what I found in small businesses is that often the people that you bring in with money also want to be involved in the business. And sometimes they don't really have the complementary skill set that you're looking for. But because they've offered you that capital, you kind of make that allowance for them to be operational. So I think chasing capital and investment is good if it's really just for the money. But I think you've got to be very careful about handing over operational experience to investors if really all they've got that you're interested in is the capital. So in my experience, I bought someone in that had the capital, had what I thought was operational experience in a certain sector that I, I needed support in, and it, they really didn't have that level that I needed. And as a result, I ended up with a business partner that was really underperforming and very difficult to exit from the business. So I think, you know, and that problem stemmed from the goal of feeling that I needed an investor. So I think that's kind of, we could talk a lot about that topic, but I think be very careful about chasing money and the concessions and allowances that you're willing to make to get that investment into your company. I have this conversation quite often when people ask me, like, how is it actually process-wise with an investment? I don't think I'm the right person to answer those questions. A, legally, I cannot give you a proper advice as a lawyer can give. But my first question would be, do you really need an investment? What does make you think you need an investment? If you have income from your business, your service provider, your product, whatever, then what is exactly that investment will do for you? Speed up the things for you? Maybe. But then you answer yourself also the kind of a question, what sort of investment do you need? You really just need capital. If you have the numbers, maybe institutional investor is a better choice. Uh, banks will be also willing to borrow you money, which is short-term temporary solution for you, just as well as you need. And you don't have to risk, for example, giving the decision to someone who is not on the same board as you are. 
So it's both things coming together. But then on the long term, again, you may also not be the right person to run the business. And that is also something that you have to face as a reality. And then having someone on board who actually is experienced in growing the business instead of just creating it may be a better choice. But are you willing to step off, give out the essentially power over your company? And then again, the question of killing a darling comes in. Why would you call your business a baby? It's a self-sustaining entity. People yeah. always do that familiarity, but then so much harder is it to differentiate yourself from the company that you build. It's a good point. And I think your point earlier about accessing money, you know, particularly in a place like Switzerland, money is really cheap if you can borrow it. Two, three percent short term loans. If that's really all you need, then that's a really great option. If you are financing growth, so if you're taking an investment to support a growth strategy, you know, maybe the question that's worth asking yourself is, you know, usually to attract an investment, you're beyond proof of concept. You have a market, you have a product, you've got established customers, but they're all at a very infinite level. So you've proven that. So maybe the best way to finance growth is organically. That means obviously slower. You know, the timeline, it's an equation of timeline there, isn't it? How quickly do you want to grow? But there's certainly nothing wrong with growing a business organically if it means it's safer, if it becomes more secure, and if you obviously don't need to let go of any of your own equity. If you're looking at a combination and where you need capital and additional skill set, if you need an internal lawyer, you need internal financial support, you need an engineer or a product developer, then it makes sense maybe to bring in some of those functional skills in exchange for capital versus paying the market for those services as a third party provider. The equation around investment and capital and raising money should also be about what skill sets are required for the business to grow and what's the time frame of growth you're chasing. It's quite credible for an SME to grow slowly and securely if they are at that proof of concept point and there's a small base of customers because all you're then doing is trying to duplicate that activity and expand it. You've already got the basis of what could work for the business. You just need to keep repeating that and expanding it. So I think it's a really big topic as to what's your intention behind capital, chasing capital. Because the moment you take money from anyone, whether it be an institution, a private investor, a wealthy customer, the expectations on you as a business owner change dramatically. And you can quickly go from an amazing feeling of success that you've generated capital to real concern about can I deliver on the expectations of the institution or the person that's provided this money. So in the end, I think getting hold of capital or in basic terms, getting the money into a business is not the difficult thing. It's making sure that you can meet those expectations. And what I've certainly found in SMEs is that a lot of investors also want to be operational, a bit what we touched on before. They might be semi-retired, they might be serial investors, they've got a bit of time on their hands as well as money. They're investing in you as a person as well as the business and maybe they're so into it they think, I wouldn't mind getting involved in that, maybe I can help out. And you know, I, I say helped out in inverted commas, but you've got to be very careful of that because that then hands over an operational responsibility to someone that or, or somebody or an institution that might not really have the right contribution to be operational. And that can be a really hard conversation to have with someone. Say, so, well, I want your money, but I don't really want your involvement. That can be a really tricky conversation, particularly if it's a private investment group, or as I said, an individual or a bunch of individuals. It can almost be an insult because they've bought into you, they've bought into your idea to the point where they're ha happy to invest. But when it comes to saying to them, but I don't want you to be involved operationally, that could go down like a lead balloon. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a convertible loan to me. There you go. There you go. <laughs> to protect yourself and the investors as well. Right. I would like to shift our focus from sort of investment and money, sure. etc. Something that is really scratching my mind right now, which is you being an Australian, your cultural background is different. Your co-working is different. Your expectations are different. Do you think there was a sort of advantage when you came to Switzerland because you come from Australia? And why I'm asking it is because, for example, I know in American market, it's all about taking the share of the market. It's not really about bringing out the profit. That's why the, the big the unicorn startups right now in the US, they are not necessarily profitable, but they have a gigantic piece of the cake, mm -hmm. which is the market share. And that's really the focus <clears throat> there. Did you find something as a similar, but in that respective to Australian and Swiss cultural background or mentality or something that you think made your way here easier? 
I don't know if it answers your question, but I think what I found is that, you know, Australians hope I've, I do this justice myself. I think a lot of the successful business people that I've met, particularly back home in Australia, and I mean, like, I had a discussion once with the CEO of a very, very large retail brand, clothing brand in Australia. We had a coffee and he was very close to investing in my business. And, you know, this is a guy that you would never get close to by any chance, but I had the introduction and we had a great conversation. But what I noticed about him, which I didn't expect, and I've seen it in other successful people running businesses back home, is that they're very down to earth people. And there's a, there's a high level of integrity and trust established immediately, particularly in, say, an older generation of people, maybe the, the age of my parents. You know, they're not as academic as we are today. You know, people like us have done our business degrees. We've probably done at least two or three degrees. And they seem like the right pedigree of the right stable of skills to have to be an entrepreneur today. This guy I'm thinking of, who was the head of a brand called Just Jeans in Australia, which became an international brand. You know, he's a guy today in his 70s. He probably grew up in a suburb of Melbourne with no formal education, but was a great communicator. He probably grew up with a very high level of engaging skills that attracted and allowed him to build networks of people that would support him. So what I have to probably get closer to your an answer for you is that I think what I've seen being an Australian in Europe is that particularly as an entrepreneur, you can articulate your ideas very clearly. There's no grandeur of thinking. You know, you're very practical in terms of what the objective of this business is, what you want to achieve. And I think you can establish trust and integrity quite clearly with people, whether it be people that you want to bring into the business on an operational level or whether it be potential investors or customers. The skill that we have as Australians, which I think is part of our, our personality, is that we're not that complicated. And I think also in business, that's really important. And we're all graduates of business schools. I look back at some of that stuff and cringe a little bit because it's not how the real world operates. You don't have to speak with an amazing vocabulary. You don't have to use fancy words when you're meeting with other business people. It's about keeping it real and authentic. And I think some of the fundamental attributes that I've really lived by in business, but also privately, is, is to be authentic and to do it with integrity. You don't need to roll through the business network with the most amazing buzzwords or catchphrases that you've picked up out of a Forbes magazine over breakfast yesterday morning. And I think we see too much of that sometimes with graduates coming out of business schools. And it's good because it's, it's buzzy and they're really engaging, sparky people. But I think at least the cultural background that I come from and what, what's helped me because it's part of my personality is kind of just keeping your feet on the ground and speaking about things in really straightforward ways with simple terminology, simple concepts, can be understood by customers, investors, colleagues. And I think that's what we have in our Australian culture, which is the only culture I know, but I definitely think it's, it certainly helps me in my operations today in a place like Switzerland. It's a long answer, but I'm um, not sure if we got there in the end, but... Perfect, thank yeah. you. <laughs> Good. <laughs> my question on the spot would be really, as you're aware, the podcast is all about motivating people towards entrepreneurship. The very first question, of course, is, I have this grand idea, but how do I start? How do I start? How do you start? You've got to share your idea, don't you? I guess with someone or somebody or test it. There's that pilot phase of the idea. You know, my latest business and it's a company called Hydropure Ionic Glass Cleaning. It's a year old today. And I had the idea while my wife was away in the US. Don't ask me how I got the idea, but I remember one night after her working day in California, I, I shared this idea with her. She's like, where did that come from? And it's like she was totally, you know, going into this whole industrial area of looking at better ways to clean residential and commercial glass. It's not something her and I have ever spoken about. She probably knew I had no interest in it. That was the first conversation I had. But And the first response was, are you crazy? So it wasn't exactly like I shared it with someone who gave me support to take it further. But over the, a period of weeks and months, as my research continued and as I introduced some technology to, to deal with that problem, of, of finding a better way to clean large panels of glass or glass objects. Then the next conversations that we're having was, oh wow, this looks like a good idea. And then before you know it, you go and test it with a potential customer and you see a result and it's like, wow, this really works. So I guess those early reactions to your own idea is that you've got to test it. You've got to have the conversation where someone can challenge you 
good or bad, as was my case. And then you've got to quickly test it as quickly as you can. And I think that's what today we might call a pilot phase. It's that proof of concept component. And try and scale up that proof of concept to a size where it becomes robust. Because only then can you say, I think I might have an idea here that's viable. Because I think we're all good at, particularly entrepreneurs, we're creative people. Like I'm a musician. That's another part of my creative brain that I can express. I don't have to take taste investment for it or anything like that, but it's a creative part of my brain. It's not that different as an entrepreneur. You're trying to solve problems. You're trying to commercialize an idea. But I think you've got to be efficient in that process because as I said, it comes back to that first topic. We can quickly fall in love with our own ideas to the point where we are gambling for so long that we haven't failed fast. If we haven't failed fast enough and we're not gambling, then it's pretty likely we might have a great idea that could be commercialized. So to answer your question specifically, I think the moment you get that idea, I think you've got to try and share it with people that are going to kind of give you that initial response. And sometimes it's not the response you want. The one I got probably should have made me stop. But 12 months later, I'm now, I've hit my revenue target. I broke even in four months. I'm independent. I'm now looking at a franchising model that may come to life within the next 18 months. So, you know, you just got to be resilient enough to stick with it, but not be gambling. Carlo, unfortunately, we are running out of time. And so we have to close the podcast recording. However, is there last thoughts you would like to share with the audience? And I would also like to announce that there is going to be a continuation of our chat because I really enjoyed it and I would like to invite you for another podcast episode for sure in the coming months. So if you have one thought that you would like to share that should motivate people to go for entrepreneurship. Yeah, I'm speaking very clearly about my own experience. So, you know, apologies up front if these don't resonate with our listeners because I think you've got to, you know, we experience life through our own eyes and soul. And this is this is really my take on the entrepreneurship. But I think what's really cool is that Keep the keep those ideas rolling. Keep energetic. Surround yourself with people like yourself who are really excited about business and new ideas and building businesses because this is really exciting stuff. Just be mindful that it's a real journey, you know, and there are days when your energy levels are really low. It's like when I do a gig, you know, there are nights when I know I'm, I'm really on pitch. I'm singing well. I know my material great and I, and I love it and it's like a drug. You want more and more and more. But, you know, there are other gigs when you just want to, crawl out the back door of the stage and disappear as quickly as possible. The difference is though, as long as by the time a few days pass by, you have enough energy to give it another go. And I think business is exactly the same, particularly as an entrepreneur. So keep looking for podcasts like yours, keep listening to this type of content and surround yourself with like-minded people. Carlo, thank you very much for sharing your thoughts and experience with me and the audience. If you don't mind sharing your contact details, social media. Sure. So most of my social media at the moment is through my, my musical side. But in terms of my business address, the best email to contact me on is service at hydropureclean.ch. The website is www.hydropureclean.ch. You can also find me on Instagram, Spotify, plug for my music, Apple Music, under my title, Carlisle Christofferson. And any way you contact me through the music channel or through my business, I'll be happy to get back in touch. I must say your name is very melodical. Uh, Thank <laughs> it you. sounds really creative and really to the point of an artist. I'll be very happy to share it via our channels, of course. And to you, dear audience, if you have any thoughts or questions, please reach out to Carlisle directly or to me and I will forward the message, of course. Don't forget to reach out to us via social media. You can find us on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, now Instagram as well. Just type Help and Trade and we are there, just as well as on any of your favorite podcasting platforms. Help and Trade, we got your back. Thank you for listening, the audience. It was a great episode with Carla. I really much enjoyed it. And I'm looking forward to have you, Carla, again. Great. Thanks for having me. And see you again soon. Absolutely. Thank you. Have a good one. Bye-bye. I've seen the color of your